across the universal whisper wakes Have you been listening for a wind of change? My ears are open, eyes aren't closed I'm waiting for a miracle again Have you been calling out my name? Oh. We're in a world taken by madness Sadness in a sea of stolen words Broken and shattered What mattered means no more In a time shaken by thunder Wonder is the seed of life foregone Crippling under What happened to us all check hey everyone how's it going it's claire uh really great to see everyone here <laughs> again welcome to 343 tv we are back for season three if you have joined us for the last couple of weeks you would have known that we've been streaming for every day pretty much every day um at 1 p.m eastern time 343 tv is run by 343 labs we are a school that's an able to survive training center um and we teach a bunch of other things too. <laughs> We're mostly based in New York and Berlin, but also on the greater internet. We have lots of online courses that we host. We also have a wonderful community that we're really grateful to have um, on Discord and YouTube and all the social media platforms out there. And I know that a bunch of the folks who do join us regularly for 343 TV are part of our Discord server and vice versa. So let us know if you wanna join the Discord <laughs> We'll send you like a link to, to join in, maybe put it in the chat. This uh, stream that you're watching now is actually pre-recorded, although I might be hanging out in the chat. Um, had a little bit of a different situation this week that didn't let me be here in person, but I'm really excited to be doing this pre-recorded stream uh, in part because it's I'm going to be covering something that I don't usually get to do often, and that is kind of, um, it's, I guess, a bit more personal to me rather than broadly... Um, 
specific with techniques having to do with Ableton Live. But before I even go there, I, let's take a step back. I always jump ahead of myself because I get really excited. Um, but my name's Claire. I am an Ableton Certified Trainer too. I teach at 343 Labs and um, I host the Monday 343 TV show, which is every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern time on our YouTube channel right here at youtube.com slash 343labs. Um, and usually I share uh, something related to Ableton Live. My show is called Tips and Tricks <laughs> in a, a kind of punny sort of way with my artist project, which is Doll Trick. But over um, here, when I teach, I go by Claire. When I do my artist stuff, I go by Doll Trick. And you can also find me at my own YouTube channel too. Uh, my, my artist name is in lowercase letters, D-O-L-L-T-R exclamation point C-K. And um, you can find my artist project stuff over there. I just completed something called January yesterday, which is um, which was basically doing a little bit of a jam involving some kind of music every day in the month, and it was a little. It was pretty intense, <laughs> but I, I told a couple of folks already. I, I mentioned this to them, but I kind of saw it also as a way to just keep mentally sane. Um, in a way, I, I've been going through a bunch of stuff, but making music has always brought me a lot of joy. So that was really fun to do. In a way, kind of reminiscent a little of um, Beat Tober, which our wonderful creative director at 343 Tetro uh, kind of spearheaded last year, which I also participated in. And the two of us, we also did a, a jam together at the end of Beat Tober. Not for not for Jamory, but for Beat Tober itself on the, I think, the last day of Beat Tober. We did a collab, and you can check out all of Tetro's really awesome stuff on his YouTube channel too, as well as our own The 43 Labs YouTube channel. Um, but this is all to say, <laughs> kind of circling back to the main topic of what I wanted to do today, um, something from my artist project. So like I said, when I when I teach and when I do these things, I usually go by... Claire, it's I keep my artist persona very separate from my educational persona, and you'll notice I have brought this up a couple of previous times when I've streamed with three four three as well. Um, so this is Claire talking about the Doll Trick project, and this is the live set that you're currently seeing for one of my songs that got released last year called Reverie. Um, and I was really lucky to have it come out on the Girl Gang label, which is run by Jeannie. She's an amazing producer and curator. Um, and I was super I was super grateful to have had um, have been allowed to, to have my track released on the Girl Gang winter compilation called Wreck the Halls. Like what how how cool is is that name? Um, so that was the winter compilation album. It came out on December 18th there were a bunch of amazing other uh, women artists who were also featured on the album and I was just really very thankful to be there along with them so this is the tune Reverie from there um, and it's pretty much a song and maybe this also kind of speaks a little bit to my background as well even though I do a lot of production work um, I also do a lot of songwriting work and for at least for me I feel like if a song or if if a production doesn't have a good like sense of writing and song ideas and lyrical ideas behind it, it definitely doesn't stand as well as another song that is f first and foremost a good song before being a good production, right? So, so in my own work as Daltrick and even something that I, I tell my students as well when they're developing their own artist projects, um, is that. Songs are important. Songwriting is important, right? So the cool part about this is that I can show you this project and I can also show you the lyrics, which are on Genius. And that's kind of what you're seeing over here. So I just pulled it up. Um, and what I'll probably do is play through the song um, and at the same time kind of run through the lyrics and... Um, scroll through the lyrics first, and then maybe I'll speak a little bit more about process, like how I got the song started from a more songwriting side and production side, or maybe it was a production side and then a songwriting side, we'll see. <laughs> uh, but I will also add that I should be in the chat, um, maybe just answering a couple of, of questions um, as they come along. So feel free to drop questions in if you have any questions um, about anything that I'm talking about, and I'll try to address it, or I'll address them next week when I'm back in person, in person, <laughs> to kind of talk about these questions. Or maybe if I get the chance to do another breakdown for another track, then I could talk about it then as well. I'm pretty excited for this year because I think um, after having gone through like a bunch of different things, I feel 
a lot more um, ready to release some of the music that I've been writing a lot of um, over the last year. I've been doing a, a lot of things kind of away from the, the public eye as far as artist um, content goes. So without further ado, let's take a listen to Reverie and then maybe take a look at the lyrics and uh, yeah, we'll see what we get. So here we go. Let's start from the, let's start from the intro. Yeah, here is Reverie by Daltrick.
<laughs> Let's head back into the middle. Yeah, okay, cool. My voice is coming through live, so that's why it's kind of um, going uh, through and we had all of those effects. But yeah, that's Reverie. Um, and that was that, that was the whole production <laughs> that eventually got out um, to, to the world. Um, and yes, as you can hear, it's a drum and bass tune. Um, fun fact, I didn't actually start off wanting to make this a drum and bass tune. Um, and this is, I guess, more of something that I've noticed over time. Like sometimes a lot of uh, people ask especially those who are both interested in the songwriting side and the production side. Like, if you're both a songwriter and producer, which do you start for? Is there a better way to start from one of them? Um, and something that I've noticed over the years is that, for me, it's um, it's really both. Um, I There are some instances where I really think of a song first, and then there are other instances where I think of a production aesthetic first, and then I go there. Reverie was a little bit special because it was almost simultaneous. Um, if I recall, the first thing that I kind of came up with was the entire idea of the uh, chorus part before the vocal chops. So this, just this little bit with the... Me close and set me free. That bit. Um, and in a way, when I, when I thought of that, um, as like a, a songwritery sort of line, I also thought of the backing vocals at the same time. So let's go ahead and take a listen to how these all sound together. I have lots of vocal things <laughs> in in my um, my music. Um, also because that was me singing, so so I do record my own vocals. But when I do record vocals, and I guess this is why what I'm gonna talk about is very special to me. I usually think of vocals really more on like an instrument type of site. Yeah, sure, there are lyrics involved too, but I love. Playing playing with vocal colors. Um, and that's in a way why, what, if, if I just were to solo the vocals, they have like a special place in my heart. So let's go ahead and try to solo all of these. And we'll just listen to how these parts interact. So you can kind of see over here also from my live set that I do try to be quite organized. Um, so for example, all my drums are a certain color, my effects are a certain color, bass um, is usually blue in my head. Um, since are usually pinkish, so most of the scents here are pinkish. The reason why it's um, blue colored as a group is I think the first, uh, one of the first like scents is actually a guitar that I played, I think. <laughs> so vocals over here, and uh, let's just take a listen to the chorus and see how it sounds without all the other instrumental parts. Hold me close and set me free Never changing Never changing Vocal chops. Still with backing vocals. So let's just take a pause there because there's a bunch of things going on. Um, but yeah, like I'm a big, big fan of like lush vocals and just layers of, of vocals. And like I said, the, when I did the chorus, it all kind of came together. I thought of the main melodic lines, but I also did think of the backing vocal lines too. So all of those counterpointy things like, ha, ah, and stuff like that, that also kind of came simultaneously. And, and like I said, I do think I got really lucky with Reverie because <laughs> everything kind of came at once. Conceptually, I thought of, um, I, I kind of had this... Um, vision in some sense of a very angelic sort of thing and you'll even hear um some of those references in the lyrics too there are a couple of like b biblical um spiritual references too um in this particular song and that was something that i think when i was putting things together they all really just fell into place thanks to prosody and i'm not sure if people have heard of prosody before but maybe i'll just take a quick moment to kind of explain um, a little bit of it um but the idea of prosody in songwriting was actually introduced to me by um, someone who i cons consider one of my biggest influences um, in music technology erin barra she is an amazing educator and musician and i had the pleasure of working with her um, as a student <laughs> and now I, I work a little with erin outside of that too but she is like 
someone I, I totally consider like a mentor and, and just an amazing um, instructor and artist. And Erin's Erin is so cool because she writes music that um, that is also very closely related to prosody. And she was the one who kind of introduced the concept to me or who I first heard describe it in a songwriting context. And it's the idea that um, if you, uh, it, let's say you have some kind of lyric that's like uh, talking about water. How do you then use your production skills to facilitate that watery type of feel? Maybe it comes from a very washed out or reverbed pad. Um, or maybe it comes from, um, I don't know, maybe some kind of uh, filtered sort of um, arpeggiator. You know, maybe a, a, something with like really high resonance. So you get a lot of that doo -doo 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 blippy sorts of sounds. Maybe that's how you do the water thing. Um, another great example that I think... Um, comes to mind is if anyone knows FKA Twix, she had an album called Magdalena and there's one track on it that <laughs> whose name escapes me now. I can't remember the exact track's name, but um, it, it talks about, I think, lyrically a relationship breaking down and you get the sound of this processed piano kind of breaking down and uh, crippling apart and a really facilitates the lyrical meaning of the song. So in this case, because I was thinking a lot about, you know, the angelic references and like heavenly sorts of aesthetics. So when I was thinking of the backing vocals, immediately um, I thought of three-part harmony, close three-part harmony, um, and also higher layers of octaves. So for example, let's only take a listen to the backing vocals now. You'll also hear that I sp um, specifically, on purpose, um, used a reverb on them that is quite bright. So almost kind of emphasizing that more like high-ish angelic sort of feel. <laughs> but let's take a listen to it over here. And then maybe we'll also take a listen to the harmony bits. But let's see, let's do backing vocals first. So, and they also kind of alternate a little bit. So that's the first one. And then the next one goes a little differently. And then it repeats again. Almost like a sigh-ish. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe that's a bunch of scary things. What I've actually done in that bit is um, it, um, it's a lot of layered whispers. So it's, hold my reverie. So it's a little creepy, I guess. Um, but in a way, kind of like, you know, gen gentle to, to an extent. Um, and that was something that, again, thinking of the whole aesthetic of the song, like how do I reach that level of, uh, you know, strange drum and bass, otherworldly, heavenly <laughs> sorts of ideas. Um, and that was, yeah, a, a very like specific production decision that, and mixing decision that I made um, to, to facilitate that. I also did want to add more rhythm to it. So you will notice or you will hear that there is... Side chaining on the vocal, um, like lots of lots of side chaining to give it a little bit of movement and lots of high passing on the on the vocals too, right? To take out that low end and really emphasize the highs of ah, and stuff like that. Um, so that was the backing vocal stuff, um, and something else that also kind of in that vein really influenced a lot of, or, or was really inspired by the aesthetic of the chorus after I wrote it, were the vocal chops. And for a, a long time, I was kind of thinking about, okay, what would be appropriate um, to have in the drop to kind of facilitate the otherworldly sort of thing. And I love using vocal chops. Last week, the stream that I did for 343 TV was about vocal chops. So you can uh, head over there to have me share a little bit more about my philosophy. Um, maybe I'm not going to repeat the exact same thing, but um, I love using vocal chops so much because they're so unique, right? There's like a ton of things that you can do with them. And I firmly believe that there is no instrument really like the human voice. So because of that, it can sound very human, but you can also get a really interesting palette of sounds if you process it differently, right? So let's take a listen to the vocal FX, whatever this group inside live might be. <laughs> and let's, uh, yeah, let's see what we get. Here we go. Oh, we got some vocoder. And then vocal chops. And lots of layers. Yeah, 
cool. So that's the the main vocal chop part in the drop, and it there is that main line that da 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 da. Um, which was the main vocal chop line, but something else that I also like doing a lot whenever I am coming up with vocal chops or even just melodies, like if you listen to some of my other Daltric music, um, that like the one that you heard in the intro, for example, I think that was Fade that was playing. Um, I love using counterpoint, which is maybe a little bit of a hangover kind of thing from my classical background. I'm a classically trained piano and flute player. And um, growing up, I was just like a, a really big fan of Bach. And my dad well, he used to play Bach in the car and, and violin concertos and, and all of those things. Um, and I used to play a lot of Bach, too, as a, a pianist. It was a lot easier for me than other composers to play Bach because <laughs> I have very small hands. So in, instead of, you know, where, where I lacked um, physical ability to stretch past an octave on the keyboard, really, I tried to make up for it in agility and dexterity, which I think was mostly successful. So it became pretty fast at stuff, which maybe you can kind of see from my controllerism things now. So I guess it all worked out. <laughs> um, but to the, to, the point of, of, to the point of counterpoint, um, this is something that I love to do even between parts as well. Uh, so you can kind of hear how when I'm doing the vocal chop stuff, and let's even take a listen, let's open these up. How many vocal chop layers do we have? A lot. <laughs> Check this out. So I think this is the main one, I believe. It should be here. Yeah. With myself chopped up a bunch. Um, I do believe that the vocal chops that you're seeing here, you can kind of see what they look like in Simpler. All of these did come from my demo vocal take. Uh, so the way that I usually like doing a lot of vocal chops in, and even just recording process in general for vocals, um, for any production that I do, I always do like a scratch vocal that I can then kind of produce around. Um, and for most part, I end up axing that scratch vocal la later down in the road and recording some proper vocals, proper harmonies with like a proper mic. So for example, this uh, mic that I have over here, it's the Sennheiser E935. I often use it for scratch vocals. And then when I might record something properly, then I might use my SM7B. So it kind of depends on the situation. But yeah, um, so scratch vocals, Yes, and you can actually see it very clearly here. It says Vogue's demo main. So <laughs> this came from my demo vocals. Um, but because of that, I, I can chop things up. I can start processing things. And it's not as if, you know, the demo vocal is like atrociously bad. I try to get it as best as I can to create the emotion and the feel that I eventually want to have. Um, and then, of course, you know, I can produce around it and, and do fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, vocal chop came from the demo vocal. But there's a lot of layers to it too, right? So I think I've got the main vocal chop over here. Let's take a look at drop one and see what we got. Yep, that's the main vocal chop. And then I do think I have a couple of other ones that are kind of um, complementing that. So for example, what's this? Yeah, we got Hold My Reverie an octave up. And then I do believe we have another something a little lower here. Yeah, so that that one comes from the backing vocals, right? So it's all kind of like related to, to one another. This one is... But I think it's drop down an octave. And then we've got some other stuff here. We've got one more, I think. This is another Hold My Reverie. Yep. And then this last one. Ha, which also came from ha, ha. So it's all derived from one another. And maybe that's also something that I get from my classical background. <laughs> this idea of organicism. Um, I, I think about uh, Beethoven a lot, and I think he was a master of this. If anyone's a fan of Beethoven, let me know in the chat. <laughs> I'll probably say hi back if, if I hear that anyone's a fan of Beethoven. Um, but if you listen to his fifth symphony, as well as the ninth, actually, the ninth is a great example of this. Uh, the fifth is the da 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 da. Uh, if you listen to that symphony, it's a really great example of how you don't actually need a really, really big range of musical ideas to create um, something that's very complicated and, you know, very masterful and grand. You just need to be able to manipulate different ideas in different ways. And that motif, the da 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 um, thing in that particular symphony is the basis for pretty much 
every other thing in the symphony. And that's a lot of what I do also in, in my music. So I, I, <laughs> I've talked about this also before in previous streams, especially in season two and season one. So if you haven't tuned into season two and season one yet, please do. There's lots of great material there, not just from me, but from other um, instructors as well. Uh, but yeah, one of the things that I, I do a lot of is I sometimes build the drop of a song first and then every other part in that song, like a verse, in this case, like what, what do I have? So I got like the verse, the build, um, like the the bridge or the uh, like a, a breakdown or whatever. Everything else is derived from the drop or the chorus. So everything comes from that most exciting part. Um, and in a way, it's, um, yeah, it's it's pretty economic. I don't know if that's like the right word. It's efficient. Yeah, maybe efficient is a better word. Um, and in a way, I find that that's a good method for also giving a lot of cohesiveness to a production. Um, so the idea that you can have a lot of material derived, derived from one section that has everything and everything else kind of references that too. So yeah, that same idea of taking existing material and repurposing it to give, um, you know, different to create different ideas, different motifs is something that I love doing, uh, which you'll hear <laughs> in like a lot of my music even beyond this. And in this case, I think even a cool um, thing that I did here was to do a vocal chop reverse. Um, so this vocal chop reverse ended up being a, a good sort of riser into the next section. Let's take a listen. And also with side chaining, <laughs> of course. Uh, so yeah, that's just like one way that you can kind of take small materials and make lots of big things out of it. Um, and then, of course, vocoder stuff, because I love vocoder stuff. If you know <laughs> my work, you'll know how much I love vocoders. And I may even do a stream dedicated to them. Let me know if you want me to do a, a stream that's dedicated to vocoders. I love vocoders. Next week, maybe I'll do one. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of different kinds of vocoders. For this particular tune, let's check out which vocoder I used. I believe it was Live's vocoder. Yes, it was. So check this out. Here is Live's vocoder. Um, it's the native vocoder to Ableton Live. Uh, I do, I'm a, I'm a big fan of a couple. I like the live vocoder. I actually really like the Bitwig vocoder. I'm also a Bitwig certified trainer and I love using Bitwig too. Their vocoder has some really nice touches. So would highly encourage you checking it out. Um, another third party vocal um, synthesizer, <laughs> its its name is a bit of a hint. Another third party vocal synthesizer plugin that I love is Isotope Vocal Synth 2. Um, I started using Isotope Vocal Synth in its original iteration as Vocal Synth 1, uh, but 2 is really great and, and I think it's really uh, a wonderful tool for crafting out different kinds of sounds. I will say though that it does tend to be very CPU heavy. Uh, so actually, let me even, let me even try this. Let me just pull over. Let's say, um, let's do an empty audio track, just so I can show you at least what vocal synth looks like. And if folks are interested, then I'll I'll properly bring it out the next time. I think, um, but you can find it in the plugins folder because it's a third party plugin. Uh, let's head over to audio units and where is Isotope? I have a lot of Isotope stuff. Big fan of the company Isotope. Hi Isotope. Uh, <laughs> we're not sponsored by them yet but hey we're here a lot of 343 instructors love isotope so hi <laughs> let's take a look at vocal synth 2 i believe it's all the way at the bottom i have a lot of stuff from isotope like i said there it is cool so i'm just going to put it on a track so that we can just at least see what it looks like it might take a second to, to show up but let's see yeah cool there it is great this is vocal synth 2 um so the way that this works is you've got five different modules that have different kinds of sound qualities to it and you kind of blend them in. Uh, but notice also how my CPU just jumped up. So <laughs> that's a lot. It is pretty CPU intensive. So for that reason, um, I also, in, in more of my recent performances, at least in the last like year or two, live performances, I mean, before before COVID, COVID hit, um, I tended to stick with vocal synth 2 for production stuff and then in live circumstances use the ableton live vocoder so that's still what i mostly do nowadays um unless there's a very specific um, sound in vocal synth that i wouldn't be able to orally replicate with any kind of a uh, series of plugins in live then i might turn to vocal synth but otherwise let's get rid of it because as much as i love it and i much i, I admire its capabilities 
well, let's reduce our CPU. So just backspace. Yeah, okay, cool. It's gone. <laughs> see, it just dropped by like uh ten percent. I will also say that because I'm I'm recording this in, with you know streaming and, and uh, OBS and everything. It's also probably why my CPU is up a little bit more. But yeah, so that's a little bit of vocal synthesis. Let's just listen to the vocoder part. Um, let's see how it goes, if we can. Ah, yes, okay, now I remember why, why I did this. Great. So let's take a listen first, and then I'll, I'll say why. Yeah, so the vocoder is actually super subtle. Um, and now I remember why I did that. See, it's so interesting to, to kind of revisit one of these older projects. Um, traditionally, when I do use vocal synth sounds, more often than not, <laughs> um, I actually do um, make them very, very noisy. So a lot of like, just because it becomes really easy to be able to hear the syllables that are coming through. But in this context, I think I was at a point in the production where I was thinking of, hey, um, I need a little bit of like upper mid-range frequencies, a little bit more chordal stuff. And I'm not sure if um, like a, a proper synth is appropriate. So a middle ground was to use vocal synth and kind of uh, uh, some kind of voc vocoder based thing um, where I could have a little bit of interesting vocal textures, but also cover a bit of the harmonic range that I felt at the time was lacking. So yeah, that's how this kind of came into play. Yay! Cool. Um, and that's also part of the reason why if you check this out in my vocoder rack, which is something I built uh, myself, I've got the low pass filter on. So let's see what happens if we take a listen and I maybe manipulate this a little bit. There's the sibilance. That's the noise. Yeah, cool. So if I move it back down, the noise kind of disappears and it's more muted. But you still get a little bit of the hint of, of the words. Um, and I, I do tend to be very caref careful of sibilance also. I've spoken about this in, in previous uh, streams too because it's something that a, a lot of people do notice. But I, I personally have a hyper sibilant voice, which means that uh, when I pronounce my S's and my T's, they tend to be very close to the back of my teeth. Um, and so because of that, they're very resonant. Uh, and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but just something that over time I've become more aware of and it's made me a more informed mix engineer, especially when I'm engineering my own vocals. So yeah, just something to keep in mind. <laughs> for for most part, I think that's also why I sound, I my vocals actually tend to sound better on mics that are um, dynamic <laughs> rather than condenser or rather than ones that pick up very bright things. Um, I mentioned this to, I think, a colleague of mine who was asking me about vocal mics and what mic I use. So for most part, in most of my recent productions, including Reverie in this one, um, to do the lead vocals, I used an SM7B, which is um, a mic that I re acquired fairly recently, like just around, I think, the end, uh, second half of, towards the second half of last year. Um, but I use that now. Um, it's a little bit less bright than some of the other condenser mics that I've used previously. For example, one time I think I was in um, a, a studio, either at college or, or some other place, where um, someone was doing like a mic shootout and I was helping them test a bunch of mics and see how they react. And we used the AKG 414, which is a very a fairly famous mic. I, it's pretty famous, right? Uh, the 414, and we put a 414 on on me, and I recorded on the 414. And usually people you know, will always say, it's a really good vocal mic, or it sounds like really neat. Um, and I just sounded as if I was like super bright. <laughs> we were like, no, that's bad mic for Claire. So, so therefore, for the Daltrix stuff, Pretty much no 414s. Sorry, 414s. Uh, but they're good on, on other vocals. I've, I've recorded many a vocal with 414s on anyone who doesn't have a hyper sibilant voice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, that's a little bit of the, the vocal chop stuff that's going on. Um, now, let me also show you a little bit of the vocals themselves. Because there is kind of in, in contrast to the angelic sound that I wanted, that I wanted in the, the chorus, I wanted the vocals in the verse to be a little bit um, harsher and a little bit grittier to an extent because the verse lyrics, and this is really where the big prosody stuff comes in, right? The verse lyrics are a little bit more like unsure 
and、uh, a little bit rough in that sense compared to the chorus. Like if you take a look at the chorus lyrics, when I wrote them, I thought a lot about the idea of like comfort. So it's like pull me close and set me free,、uh, never changing, never changing. So you know you're safe with me. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting. Just hold my reverie.、Um, and it's like a very comforting sort of thing.、Um, but the comfort is preceded. By the、uh, uncertainty, so will the visions left unseen fill the spaces in between us? <laughs>、um, and I like to do these things also as a, a songwriter, where sometimes I make the rhymes in between, <laughs> or like before the end of of a line. So in this case, unseen and between. I think I did the same thing in verse two. Yeah, I think yeah.、Uh, born of insecurity, scorned by faces disbelieving. So, <laughs> so that's something that I do as a, like a, a songwriter thing.、Um, same thing also here with like I want you to fly, you want me to lie awake. <laughs> so this is it's kind of like a theme in in this particular tune.、Um, but yeah, so the uncertainty I wanted there to be a bit of a different vocal texture. So let's just take a listen to the vocals in the verse and maybe compare them a little bit with the.、Um, Vocals in the chorus. So here we go. Here's like the the verse stuff. Yeah, cool.、Um, and I think probably the most、uh, crucial thing to this gritty sound is this device over here, pedal.、Uh, I'm a big fan of this. I love putting pedal. Vocals. I did this in one of my other tunes, and for like also a grittier thing. And I think it's a really interesting alternative to say the more traditional kind of saturation and distortion that one might put on vocals if you're looking for overdrive.、Um, but yeah, I love using pedal and amp on vocals. I think it gives it a really interesting color. Almost makes it lean more towards the instrumentally side, like I mentioned.、Uh, something else that I did in this case, which I guess your traditional mix engineer would advise you against. Uh, is put a delay and reverb directly on the lead vocal, <laughs>、um, and I think it was because when I was trying to to think of the vocal and construct it,、um, I really did want it to be really fuzzy.、Um, usually, I w- I wouldn't recommend this, I, and this is even something I usually do in in my normal workflow. I have the delay and reverbs on return tracks, which I also did in this case.、Um, but yeah, for the the main vocal for the the verse part has all of these like different processes. Processes、um, running on it to just kind of m- mangle the sound a little bit more and make it a little different. And I do think the chorus vocals are processed differently too, so that's why I have them on a separate track. But yeah, I think that it's it's really effective in being able to bring some of that grittiness out. So I'd love to do a little bit of A Bing. Let's go ahead and take a listen, maybe even to the second verse where my delivery of the vocals is a little bit more forward. Like I think the first verse, I did it more in. Um, a head voice sort of thing. So very gentle, like will the visions left unseen. But I think the second verse is a little harder. Like, uh, uh, the lyrics over here, we can also kind of see that they are a little bit more, uh, a little bit more griefish, <laughs> like one of insecurity. So I think I did more like of a chest voice sort of thing. So let's listen to verse two, and let's switch between pedal on and pedal off. So here is with pedal first. <laughs> Yeah, so you can hear that, and it, it's even doubled with, say,、um, a an octave below that. So you can also hear it over here. Let me just play it. So I got an octave below there. Cool.、Um, so that's with the pedal. Over here, let me even just open that up a little bit. Yeah,、um, let's see what we sound like without the pedal. Born with insecurity. So cleaner. <laughs> Scorn by faces But maybe for the context of the song, a little less interesting.、Um, so yeah, I, I think that's maybe why I did did put in the pedal and why I did. Actually, give it quite a lot of the the dry wet compared to what I normally do. Like sometimes when I use the pedal on vocals, I just give、um, like ten percent wet, <laughs>、um, and in this case, it's like twenty five, and it's also on fuzz, which is one of the more fuzzier algorithms. So so it gives that really a lot of that、um, crunchiness. 
It's like my voice is an electric guitar. <laughs> Yeah, and you can also actually hear that um, the breaths do become more dramatic. That's something that we that I usually try to be very careful of. In this case, I don't think it was um, extremely crucial. But sometimes if I do end up using, say, a compressor or some kind of um, distortion device on vocals, I might even just go in and check out the places where I have breaths in singing. So like, <gasps> like or things like that. Maybe a little bit less dramatic than that. Um, but I just cut them out, trim it, and I just make it softer so that the breath is still there there, and it doesn't sound that I'm not like, you know, not human, I'm not breathing. I still am breathing, but it's just more subtle and more controlled. So it's just a manual adjustment with like clip volume or something like that. But yeah, that's the vocal processing stuff. Very cool. Um, and something else that I, I guess I, I do want to also bring up, this is a lot of, of vocal stuff. I guess this is mainly like a, a vocal breakdown to, to some degree, is that I do a lot of harmonies also. So even for the chorus uh, vocal, or the build, really, over here. They will find their own peace of mind. Like, different Afraid stacks of these. Of all the dreams we've dreamed. And also going with the backing vocals, I think. Very high past. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, but yeah, I just, again, love the vocal stacks. For me, it's really like a palette of wonderful colors. So that's the vocal stuff. Yeah, cool. I'm going to close these up right now. And I like to jump a little bit maybe to the more instrumentally parts in the last um, couple of minutes that I have. No, last couple of minutes. Still some time. Um, but yeah, everyone, if you do have questions, please drop them into the chat. Um, and we'll make a note of them. And I'll keep my eyes out uh, for those, hopefully answer a few of, of these questions for people. But yeah, maybe this also does kind of extend um, to to beyond this particular stream. But if there are any topics that you feel you might be interested in, the 343 team is always open to them. Like ultimately, I guess each of us, uh, each of the instructors who host 343 TV have our individual shows. But maybe you, if you've thought of something that you would really want to cover, uh, you can let us know and you can bring it up to us. For example, um, Abe Duquet, <laughs> who is one of our amazing instructors, legendary um producer dj please check out abe's show as well like he does a lot of wonderful production q a and i've learned so much just from watching abe's streams also um, and sometimes he has wonderful guests sometimes he wears a suit which totally puts the rest of us out of commission because we don't wear suits uh, or leather jackets abe's been rocking the leather jacket so abe has his show or if you want to learn about music theory then max our co-founder of 343 Labs, he runs the music theory show. So if you have theory questions, got to ask Max. And he's doing a lot of really cool things on his show with genre-specific stuff as well. So like Psytrance and drum and bass and all of these different things related to music theory. Um, and I should also mention we've also got a couple of other shows um, by some of our other instructors like Justin Beck, um, and Adam Partridge, Atropolis, um, as well as Tetra, our creative director too, all covering different things like production, um, things like working with samples, um, even genre-specific stuff with the amazing John Selway on Saturdays for Selway's Techno Saturdays. I think that's probably the catchiest like name of our 343 TV series. So the rest of us need to do better, but hey, <laughs> we're, we're here for now. Uh, but yeah, please check out all of these things on Tuesday, uh, which is tomorrow. There will be Tetro Talks. So Tetro is going to talk to someone. <laughs> or sometimes he talks to a lot of people. Sometimes Tetro has these call-in shows. Um, but yeah, the best way to kind of keep up with us is really to just subscribe to our YouTube channel, which I'll re uh, remind everyone of at the end of my time today as well. But in the meantime, I'm wondering what the instrumental bit sounds like in Reverie. So let's go ahead and mute all of the vocals and take a listen to how the... Let's do the build into the chorus. Maybe that might be interesting. Let's do build two into chorus two. Here we go. Just the instruments. Yeah, 
So, so that's the instrumental bit. <laughs> Lots of layers and stuff like that, but you can kind of hear, I guess, the, what, what I did. Um, this ARP, I kind of wanted to highlight it because when I was talking about the water prosody thing earlier on, this is kind of what I had in mind. Um, and I should also add that I think, I may be wrong, but uh, unless I, I, I see otherwise, I think all of the instruments that I use in this track were from live. Um, so, so no third party stuff like serum or whatever. Um, I, I do use those a lot. I'm a big fan of those too. Uh, but I think for this one, I did use all live instruments. And I'm not sure why. Um, I think it's just because I found sounds and I thought they were good. So I used them. <laughs> and I may have tweaked them a little bit. But for example, this liquid bass line, pretty sure this is, um, this is an instance of, yeah. Okay, it is an instance of operator, which is an FM synth in live. Um, so if I close this back up, let's hide these devices. I should also add that this is Live 11 that you're seeing me use right now. So if things look a little different, um, it's because it's, it's Live 11, <laughs> which is coming out sometime this year. We're working on a lot of material related to it. So please stay tuned. I've been filming a lot of videos, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and solo this and take a listen to this ARP 16, um, which again, I've clearly labeled so I can kind of know what it is, but it's, it's a kind of like squelchy resonant sort of thing. Yeah. It's kind of like bleeping and blooping a little bit. Um, and I like the sound a lot. In a way, it's partially because um, it does remind me a bit of a modular synthesizer, and I'm a big fan of using modulars. Um, I don't currently have access to a very large one, but I used to love playing with them at college. And also in New York, if you are in New York, um, there is a wonderful shop called Control in Brooklyn. Um, and they're, they're awesome. That, uh, they don't just sell modulars. They sell a lot of other, other electronic music stuff too. For example, um, what, some of you already know this, but I am a controllerist as well. So I, I do a lot of electronic music performance and um, I use specifically a lot of MIDI controllers. One of my favorite controllers is called the Q-Neo made by Keith McMillan Instruments. And it has an attachment that's called the Rogue that lets it go wireless. So I bought my Rogue from the lovely folks at Control. So thank you, Control. Hi, I don't know if anyone from Control's watching, uh, but you still have playing with modulars over there. And this kind of sound is, is a little bit reminiscent of what I might get from, say, um, a sequencer and um, work with that. And I do use sounds occasionally recorded in from my modulars, not for Reverie in particular, but for some of the other work that I've been doing. I've been recording a lot of my O Coast or my Zero Coast or my No Coast. <laughs> it goes by many names, but it's a, um, a semi-modular little little one um that's called uh the zero coast i guess by make noise and it's really lovely i love using that a lot too it kind of also gives you a little bit of similar like resonant bandpass filter um sounds and also a little bit more ooh, whoops uh slightly smaller resonant bleeps and bloops here with some of their patches so big fan of make noise things as well but yeah this this um kind of reminds me a little bit of that too I think something worth noting also is that I believe this patch or this preset um, was originally a bass preset, but I kind of turned it into like a, a synth thing. Um, and that's maybe something that I, I often like, like to do. I purposely look for sounds that are not <laughs> in the right categories. So for example, if I find, if I want like a, a, a bass sound, I might even look in like the pad category. Like if I want a very long thing, because a, a pad could work really well as a bass if it's a droney sort of situation, right? And in this case, I think I probably heard the preset and was like, hey, this could be a cool ARP line. So let's make it an ARP line. Um, but yeah, so a little bit of that. Something else that I like doing a lot of in drum and bass music, which is a little bit idiosyncratic to the genre in a way, is do some strings. Um, so I got some fake strings over here. Um, and instead of using a default um, string preset, in live, like for example, you've got like the string ensemble stuff, right? And I guess that's one thing that maybe isn't the best in live, the built-in orchestral sounds. Although in Live 11, we've got some interesting things coming up, thanks to Spitfire Audio and the lovely team over there. But for now, um, when I was making this, I think I started the project in Live 10 and then moved over to 11, I think. Or did I make it in 11? No, no, actually I started making it in 11. Um, but this is a technique that I also have used in my other live time projects, which is instead of using the string ensemble preset, layer the strings yourself. 
So I've got a cello over here and I've got some violas and violins and I made my string section <laughs> instead of using the um, ensemble. So for that, to, to that end, I think it does give it a little bit more variation because you are getting different types of instruments and you can also do some interesting um, panning if you're putting things into an instrument rack, which is what I did here. So here's what the strings sound like, or at least a little bit of the strings. Yeah, you kind of got them being side-chained a little too, and then harmony. And again, kind of going back, I guess, to my classical <laughs> background, there's like three-part um, counterpoint, I think, towards this later half, yeah. So you've got two-part over here, and then moving to three parts. So you got violin, viola taking middle line, cello taking the bottom line and then I think building up to some kind of reverb and then back into the uh, chorus yeah so those are kind of um, the string parts now I guess I know that my time is almost up uh, I'm trying to keep a, a, a look at the time also um, but I guess the last thing that I'll bring in if I can just tease a little bit um, is that I love, love, love the use of silence. I think silence is one of the most powerful things that you can use. And for that reason, right before both of the choruses in this piece, there's like a moment of silence in the instrumental, which maybe you caught a little bit of as well. Let's listen to the first silence again, and then I'll show you the second silence one more time. Because that was what we listened to already, actually. So here's the first silence from the first build. It's like building, building, building up to a point. Here we go. We're almost there. And then... So I like doing that a lot. Um, and I, I find that it works fairly effectively, especially if um, the parts are kind of working with each other and you end up getting the vocals kind of being soloed and then everything comes back in. So let's listen to the second part of the... Uh, bill, uh, the second build, excuse me. Um, and for one last time, we'll hear the chorus of Reverie. Here we go. And that was the chorus of Reverie. Um, and I know that my time is actually coming up. So thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for um, always joining us in the 343 Labs community. It was really fun kind of breaking down Reverie a little bit. And it's it's interesting because the more I listen to it, I'm kind of split into two veins. Like a part of me is just like, hey, I made this, which is awesome. And then, of course, there's the other part that's like, this could be this is so bad. This could be like 10 times better. Um, but I think over the years, and maybe this is, I guess, my last note that I might wrap up on, is that I've not, I've kind of made it a point to live with dissatisfaction. It's like, you know, there's, there's always going to be some things I feel that will always try to um, haunt us in, in a way. Um, it's like, you know, I wish this vocal could have been recorded better. I wish I could have programmed this better. I could have mixed this better. Um, but ultimately... I mean, we keep we do keep getting better over time. So that's also one one philosophy I try to keep in mind when I release music. It's like it the, it's the best I can do for now, and that's okay. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone again for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Um, please stay tuned for the rest of Three Four Three TV this week. I will be back next week, maybe talking about vocal synthesis, maybe. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. If people are interested, because that's what I, I mentioned, let me know if, if that sounds cool. So yeah, thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Um, please stay tuned for Techo Talks tomorrow, and I will see all of you soon. <laughs> cool. Bye. See you next week.
Across the universe, so whisper wakes. Have you been listening for a wind of change? My ears are open, eyes aren't closed. I'm waiting for a miracle again. Have you been calling out my name? Huh? We're in a world taken by madness. Sadness in a sea of stolen words Broken and shattered What mattered means no more In a time shaken by thunder